direct from Kansas City, it's Comic Book Late Night with Captain Logan! Featuring brand new comic book reviews, thoughts on comic news, obscure character of the week, and a little something from the comic vault. And now, here's Captain Logan! Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan, and this is indeed Comic Book Late Night. Hey, uh, Fear Itself is beginning this week. Here's the Fear Itself prologue, and uh, in honor of giant, huge crossover events, uh, I've decided that Geekvolution is going to do its own mega crossover event. Now, usually here at Geekvolution, we try to be leaders and not followers, but, you know, as I always like to say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the giant crossover events seem to be the, uh, the in thing to do right now. Marvel always has one. DC seems to always have one. Uh, IDW is even currently doing one. And so uh, I thought, you know what? It's time for Geekvolution to have a crossover event. And our crossover event is going to be called Crisis on Infinite Vinces. And uh, I can't tell you too much about it. Uh, I'm trying to keep it mostly on the down low. But uh, I, I want to let everybody know about it so they can get uh, super excited without having any idea exactly what it's going to be. So that by the time it comes out and everybody's thrown around the title uh, over and over again, uh, people want to buy it just because they've heard it constantly over and over again. Uh, that's the that's the basic idea. So um, every time I'm on camera, uh, I'll say "Crisis on Infinite Vinces" at least two, three, four times uh, just to get you you know excited about the uh, about the event that you know very little about. Now uh, the event uh, is going to include everybody who's ever been on uh, on Geekvolution. Uh, it's going to be a huge crossover event. Uh, so it's going to include Manos and Duke and Brown Coat Eric and uh, Shades at Night and uh, everybody who's ever been on the channel, a Ziploc over, everybody who's ever been on the channel uh, will, will be involved in the crossover event. Uh, our videos uh, that are in the event uh, are going to be, unfortunately, we're going to have to start charging you $3.99 for them. Uh, sorry about that, but it's a, it's a big crossover event, so uh, tr trust us, it'll be worth it. Uh, $3.99 uh, for, for, for each video. And uh, our other videos will, of course, uh, uh, just be two ninety nine, and uh, except for you know any any tie-ins. So uh, you know any other channels involved, uh, like 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 Duke and Manos, uh, their videos, their tie-in videos will also be three ninety nine. Uh, sorry about that, but like I said, it will certainly be be you know absolutely worth it. So like I said, I can't tell you too much about it other than the fact that it will change the face of the Geekvolution universe. Uh, and hopefully that will entice you to want to buy it. That very vague uh, idea, it will change the face of the Geekvolution universe. And uh, some of our videos will have uh, variant intros. There will be various variant intros, um, but it, most of them will have very little, if anything, to do with what's actually in the video. Uh, I, I figure a lot of the variants will just have um, like, like, uh, like pictures of, um, of uh, Brown Coat Eric to entice you to watch the video, and then he won't actually be in the video. It'll just be uh, me and Vince uh, talking, like we like we always do. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Crisis on Infinite Vinces. Uh, look forward to it uh, coming in the next uh, couple months, and uh, make sure to watch the prologue, uh, which will be coming uh, just in a in a in a in a couple weeks to get y'all riled up. And it, it too, of course, will be three ninety nine. Um, Naturally, of course, I'm kidding. Uh, but anyway, uh, Fear Itself, uh, we'll see how this goes, and um, I'll be reviewing this in just a little while. Uh, tonight, my special guest is a fellow reviewer. Uh, he is one of the biggest Spider-Man fans I know, and he uh, reviews comic books and video games. He took fifth place in Who Reviews the Reviewers. Tori GNR1 is on the program. And I uh, look forward to that and more, but right now, it's time for uh, Rapid Fire comic book reviews. Brand new Rapid Fire comic book reviews, right now. Okay, let's jump right into the Fear Itself prologue, Book of the Skull. Being a prologue, this is of course all set up, and my guess is that when the Fear Itself title starts, you probably won't even really need this. 
It's a pretty long-winded way to say Red Skull's daughter, Sin, who looks a lot like Red Skull, is continuing Red Skull's old quest in the present for a great power he was looking for during World War II. In the past, Captain America, Bucky, and Namor stopped Red Skull, mostly by beating a giant monster that apparently guards the, quote, secret weapon from the great beyond. The weapon in question is a hammer, and by the end of the issue, Sin knows where it is and is going after it, saying that it was always her destiny, not her father's, to find it. And judging by the picture of a crippled and unconscious Thor in the promo poster on the very next page, it's made her probably more powerful than he is. And no surprise, it looks like Fear itself is going to heavily feature both Thor and Captain America. Gee, I wonder why. This really isn't the tone I expected for this book, after all the talk in the promos about how Fear Itself is supposed to tackle current issues that really hit close to home and deal with our society's current worst fears. That sounds really intriguing, and perhaps that's what the series itself will be, but this feels like a pretty standard setup for a villain plot. It reads pretty much like a Captain America book, which makes sense considering it's Brubaker. It's beautifully drawn, competently written, but I found it standard nevertheless. So that's that, and uh, let's jump then into Punisher Max number 11. I'm not going to show a whole lot of art from this issue for the sake of our younger viewers. It's probably page for page the most graphic issue of the series. Bullseye spends a lot of time of it with nails through his head, that's all I'm going to say. This is the conclusion to the Bullseye story, the final, bloody, gruesome showdown between Punisher and Bullseye. I won't tell you how it goes down, but it's extremely twisted. Bullseye finally gets what he's wanted this whole arc, the chance to meet his idol in battle, to look into the eyes of the killer with the most complex psychology he's ever seen, and to tell Frank himself why he became the Punisher, because Bullseye understands him better than he understands himself. I think this arc ends the only way it could have, and I'm really wondering if it can possibly go any longer than one more issue. And now, uh, on to DC, let's look at Brightest Day number 22. Nearly every issue I've got this week is either setting something up or winding things down, and three issues away from the end of Brightest Day, this one is doing a little of both. For the last few issues, each one has closed off an arc for one of the characters we've been following. This time it's Firestorm, who faces off against the Anti-Monitor and, of course, Deathstorm. This actually looks like the end of Deathstorm, unfortunately, because he's easily been one of the most fun elements of the series. I love his sarcasm and witty retorts. And he's got a great one here when he tells Firestorm how impressed he is that he lasted a whole 45 seconds against the Anti-Monitor. Without giving anything away, the White Lantern continues moving its pawns where it wants them and eliminating anyone who has served their purpose. There's another important death at the end of this one, though it's not who you might expect. The issue is still wonderfully unpredictable, and I'm very engaged with this writing, finding myself as frustrated and powerless as our heroes are, considering the White Lantern seems to have full control of everything. A lot of epic action and plot, but I appreciate with all this heavy mythos, the series is never entirely without a sense of humor. When Firestorm flies down to pick up the White Lantern, he says, hello there, and the Lantern actually replies, hello. So uh, just two more of these to go, and I, I gotta say, I'm gonna be kinda sad to see the series end. Uh, now on to Red Robin number 21. You know, last issue I was starting to get a little tired of this internet stuff. Oh, once again, the internet being a supervillain internet Darkseid was using to take control of supervillains. But now Red Robin is trying to stop Mikalek from controlling it for his own evil purposes. But now I see what Fabian Nietzsche's is doing with it, and it's a perfect, timely social commentary. Science fiction will often take an idea to its furthest extreme, to comment on an aspect of human social nature, like Orwell did with 1984. And that's the kind of idea we have here. Red Robin discovers that Mikalek not only wants to control the villains in the internet, but he also wants to make the internet the next internet and make it available to all people. And anyone who plugs into it loses all their inhibitions and becomes the worst part of themselves. Red Robin believes that people won't be able to stop themselves from tapping into that kind of power, just as people are intoxicated with the power of instantaneous knowledge we get from the internet. And of course, he has to stop this from happening. He's aided by Anarchy, who fights against any, quote, rigid social establishment, and this is a creation of dark sides after all. Red Robin fights a group of insane villains called the Mad Men, who spew bizarre conglomerations of pop culture references at random. Is this message a little heavy-handed? Maybe, but it's also very entertaining, and I found myself nodding a lot about the satire. It's a really interesting world we're living in. So uh, we're all done with that story arc, and uh, it'll be fun to see what uh, where he goes with it next. And uh, now on to um, Tiny Titans number 38. Yep, I'm still reading this. 
This issue is all about Aquaman and the Underwater Titans, and it's up to its usual high standard of comedy and clever DC in-jokes. The Underwater Titans start their own pet club, and Star Spangled Kid brings a box of Star Rose, so naturally, they immediately start latching onto people's faces. Probably my favorite joke deals with a league of superhero cows, including a bat cow, an aqua cow, and what I'm pretty sure is supposed to be a firestorm cow. And finally, uh, over to IDW, let's take a look at Ghostbusters Infestation number one. Like the first issue of Star Trek Infestation, I really enjoyed this one, and I'm worried about the second one. This issue is well-paced, Eric Burnham has a good handle on the characters' voices and gives them some great comedic banter, I like Kyle Hotz's artwork and the balance it strikes between horror and comedy, but I'll say it again, all these minis needed to be at least three, if not four issues. Two just isn't enough for a fully engaging story. There's a really intriguing idea here about phantoms possessing zombies, and I love the rules set up about how the Ghostbusters tech works, or doesn't work, against the zombies. But two issues is just not enough time to do that idea justice. The zombies here are just hideous, and when a cat gets zombified, I love that Ray says, and suddenly we're in a whole other sort of movie. I was also pleasantly surprised that, unlike the zombie Tribbles cover with Star Trek, the cover of this issue is actually significant to the story. So that's it for today's Rapid Fire comic book reviews, and now, on to the news! So, hits and misses with the news this week, but mostly misses. Uh, it looks like, according to Jeff Johns, that the Sandman TV show that's been off and on uh, the last couple of years is actually going to happen now. And um, the problem is that it's going to be on the CW. So, I mean, even though Jeff Johns is attached, and even though Neil Gaiman seems to be involved in some sort of capacity, uh, I can't imagine that it's going to be the show that fans actually want to see because it's going to be on the CW. And considering their target, their target audience, the CW's got to have um, some bizarre mandates that they're going to have to cast particular kinds of people that look a certain way and that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I really imagine that uh, the, the fans that are afraid that it's going to be something like The Vampire Diaries but with Sandman, I think that fear is totally warranted. Uh, a lot of people were really happy when we found out that Wonder Woman wasn't going to be on the CW. Of course, I think what NBC is doing with it may not be any better than what it might have been with, done with the CW, but yeah, that's not the network that I would have wanted to see Sandman on. Uh, I think it would have been a lot better if it had been on you know a cable network. Uh, but but anyway, so you know we'll see what happens. What I think is really strange is that the CW passed on Wonder Woman, but they uh, they're, they're doing Sandman. You know they they think they they've got the money to do Sandman, uh, but not Wonder Woman. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but apparently that's supposed to happen sometime next year. So we'll we'll see what happens there. Um, stranger even than that, uh, I think is who has been apparently chosen by Fox for the Daredevil Reboot's director. Uh, David Slade is going to be directing the reboot, apparently, and uh, he directed 30 Days of Night, which I didn't especially care for, and he also directed uh, Twilight Eclipse. Uh, and other than that, he's directed mostly music videos. My question is, how is this better than Mark Steven Johnson? Uh, now, this is coming from somebody, of course, who actually liked the original Daredevil movie, or, if nothing else, the, the uh, director's cut. And I, I don't really feel like I need a Daredevil reboot, but if it's got to be done, I, I, you know, I, I hope it's actually improved upon. Because I certainly think that you know, what Mark Steven Johnson did could be improved on. Um, I'm just not sure that's going to happen with who they chose. So, again, we'll see what happens there. Uh, but here's my one bit of really good news. Uh, the new Arkham City trailer is out. Uh, there's a gameplay trailer out that just happened this week, and it makes me feel like October is way farther away than it felt before because it looks really awesome. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a lot more open world than uh, Arkham Asylum was and that you're going to be able to do... Yeah, yeah it's, You're going to be on the city streets of Gotham, of and of course we knew that, but it looks really fun. And uh, the other thing I'm really excited about is that um, rather than just being able to glide around with your cape, it looks like now you can... Um, you have a lot more freedom in the air. You can do more, you know, dive bombing and then glide back up and that sort of stuff. So, uh, anyway, it looks really fun, and um, I can't wait for October. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to talk about this week is just that the cape got canceled. That's right. After ten episodes, the cape is already canceled. And in fact, uh, they televised nine of them, and they're not airing the tenth one. It's only available online. So, if you've been following the cape, or you uh, or you haven't been, but you wanted to watch it, uh, now's the time. Go on NBC.com and watch the 
them because they won't be around for much longer, I'm sure. And since they only made 10 episodes and since the uh, ratings were apparently really abysmal, uh, I doubt we'll ever see it on DVD. So um, do yourself a favor and watch them if, uh, if you're interested. And uh, that's it this week for the news. And now how about a trivia question? Today's trivia question is, Stephanie Brown's father is the Clue Master, but before he became a supervillain, he was a failure at what career? If you think you know, leave your answer in the comments below. And last week's question was, in the Spawn universe, what is the costume supernatural alias of Phil Temper? And uh, the clue was that it's a mantle that other people have had, uh, that, that there's multiple people that have had the mantle. And the correct answer, of course, was the Redeemer, first known as Anti-Spawn. Uh, but he became Redeemer when Phil Temper uh, took the mantle. And the uh, person who got that first was Jaden Nova. So congratulations to you, one of our regular viewers. And uh, like I said, be sure to leave your answer for this particular question in the comments. And now, uh, it's time for another exciting edition of Know Your Batmobiles. Here's a Batmobile. What year do you think it's from? Is it from 1991, 1995, or 1997? And I'll come back at the end of the show and let you know. And now it's time for useless knowledge to cram your brain with. late night. I am Dooms Vince, and I have come here to bring a message of destruction, a message of hate for Captain Logan and his viewers, his faithful viewers, the Logan Tears, his viewers who help him through thick and thin, and I am not fond of him. I feel it pertinent to say why I hate Captain Logan for the main reason. He's just silly. He makes you laugh with his dry humor. He makes you cry with his dry humor. I met Captain Logan when we were just lads. We went to school together at the university. I had several minions at the time who he stole from me. I called these minions Freshmen. These Freshmen were lured away from me with promises of a grander life than I could offer them. All I offered them was a chance to rule the world and destroy mankind. That was it. But Captain Logan said, you have the chance to be my Logan Tears. You have the chance to be super sidekicks. And they thought sidekick sounds like a good deal. And I said, I prefer the life of thought. I prefer the life of villainy. Faithful viewers, or oh, my soon-to-be faithful viewers, I have but one challenge for you at the moment. Yes, one challenge I would like for you to leave comments in the comment bar and let me know who my faithful viewers are, who my minions are to be, who will fall from the ranks of Logan Tears and become my doomsayers. Leave your comments. And... And next time, next time that I manage to hack through his programming, next time I will let you know what benefits there are to being my minion, my doomsayers. Stay tuned, faithful ones. And that is the long and sordid history of Oliver Queen's Boxing Glove Arrow. Uh, tonight, my special guest is Tori GR1. Uh, like I said, he was in Who Reviews the Reviewers and took fifth place, and uh, he's a fellow comic reviewer, but he also reviews video games and all kinds of other things. Uh, he's uh, really uh, competent, really insightful, and uh, here he is on the Comic Grill. Let's take a listen. Okay, I'm here with Dan, Tori GNR1. Hello. And uh, Dan, you are now going to enter the Comic Grill. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Dan, question number one. Uh, what is the best ongoing Marvel book you're currently reading? 
Uh, the best ongoing Marvel book. See, that's tough because um, I'm just reading a lot of uh, X-Men stuff, trying a lot of that stuff lately, and I think yeah. the best thing I'm reading now is actually the Venom book because Amazing Spider-Man's good, but it's in that kind of pretend universe, so I, I, I wouldn't necessarily call that good. So I'm going to say the Venom book. I really enjoyed that a lot, and I'm looking forward to where it goes. I'm reading some other stuff too, but... It's just I'm enjoying the DC side of everything I'm reading more. Uh, yeah, this is outside of the questions, but um, are, are you reading some DC? Because you, you do so much Marvel stuff, I had I, I assumed you weren't reading any DC. I'm reading Batman Inc. and uh, Batman the main series. I'm going to be trying The Dark Knight and possibly Detective Comics because I've heard really good stuff about that. And I was reading Superman before, but I dropped it because it got terrible. Yeah, so did I. Uh, but uh, Dark Knight is pretty good. Um, I mean, we've only had one issue so far, but uh, but, yeah. it was, but it was pretty good. And um, Detective is one of the best things I'm reading right now. Yeah, I was uh, thinking of... Was, oh, sorry. sorry. What he's doing with Gordon is just phenomenal. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about that, and I've never actually read any Scott Snyder stuff. I've seen some jock art um, with the Daredevil Reborn book on the covers and some other stuff that I've read I can't really recall. But um, I really want to check out Detective because it seems like everyone's saying that's the best Bat book out right now. So, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if it's the best. I mean, Ink is really good, but uh, it's you know it's 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 a different thing. It's uh, yeah, it's very much. detective stories, you know, which is really good. Uh, yeah, I don't know if Jock's staying on the book because uh, he didn't draw last issue. Oh, okay, but, but I don't. So I don't know. But he but he did the 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 three before that uh, when when the new when the new arc started. Okay, I'll definitely have to check it out then, because I'm kind of looking for a book outside of Ink that's like traditional Batman stories that's really good. Like, Batman's just okay. I'm just reading it mainly because I had been on it for such a long time, and I'm hesitant to drop it. But, I don't know, I'm going to check out Detective and possibly Dark Knight. Well, uh, question number two is apparently related to the first. Uh, we, so both of us like Venom number one quite a lot, and I wanted to ask you where do you think uh, uh, Remender is going to take the book, and do you think that uh, now that Cletus Cassidy seems to be back, that Carnage might be the logical choice for Flash Thompson's eventual arch nemesis? I think Carnage would be a really good choice, actually. I think that where he's going to take the story could, well, potentially could be really interesting, because Venom has always projected its knowledge of past hosts onto the current one so mm -hmm. potentially flash Com thompson could find out peter parker's spider-man and that could play out as to be a very interesting story um because you know flash he's spider-man's number one fan he's bullied peter parker all his life he's kind of like a a friend to he's a friend to him now but he kind of still rags on him a little bit um so I think that could be really interesting. And then with Carnage, I think they should definitely bring him in and uh, be an arch nemesis. And then um, I want to see Eddie Brock somehow involved in this symbiote situation thing because he's anti-Venom and Marvel's not doing anything with him right now. At all, yeah. I don't think they've done anything with him since his miniseries. Yeah, the miniseries, I, did, I wasn't too keen on it. Like, I've heard a lot of people liked it. I'm surprised that I didn't. So, like... I I liked it too, but I think part of it is because I don't usually care for Punisher, and I actually like what they did with him there. So, hmm. yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, that's a whole other thing to get into. I <laughs> just get on a rant about that series, but anyway. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, it, the thing, the thing is, I think it's all going to hinge on what they do with the end of the Carnage mini. Because, uh, I mean, you know, they've revealed Cletus Cassidy is there, but who knows how it's going to end. But it, it seems to me like it would be um, kind of strange if it was, a, uh, um, you, you know, if they just happened to do Carnage and Venom at the same time and didn't keep him in the Carnage suit. Right. I think that, like you said, that it's n not a coincidence, and they should put them together somehow. Actually, Manos commented on my Venom number 1 uh, review, and he said maybe Eddie Brock should become Carnage. And... I that think would be really interesting. That would be really interesting. I don't think Carnage would bond with him, though. Yeah, that's true, because it was his father, and they had the whole rivalry. And, and he hates him. He yeah. hates him more than he hates Spider-Man. Yeah, that's true. So, I don't know if that could happen, or if it would happen, but if it did, I think that would be really interesting. But yeah, you said something I'd never thought of, because uh, I, I guess I just immediately made the, the assumption that Flash Thompson would know who Spider-Man was because Venom was with him, but he's not bonded to him. Right. So it didn't even occur to me that he wouldn't just immediately know everything Venom knows, like past hosts have. 
Right. So if the symbiote eventually bonds to him, which I think that's going to be the the thing driving the story forward. Well, it is now. The the constant threat of Flash not bonding with the symbiote, you know, yeah. he has to keep from bonding with it. And if it eventually happens, that's the that's the thing that's gonna make or break, you know, this relationship. Between... Which is w- wonderfully engaging. Right. Exactly. Because it's even great for people that you know are you know huge Spider-Man fans like me that aren't necessarily fans of the Solo Venom stuff. I'm liking this stuff so far, but I was never a big fan of the Solo Venom stuff, but I'm reading this book thinking in the back of my mind, what if Flash finds out that Peter's Spider-Man and then you know that could have repercussions on the Spider-Man book. So I love how it, they're tying into each other, interweaving plots potentially for the future. I really like that about it. And I never thought Venom would work as a superhero. And he, now he's either. a superhero and it works. Yeah, like Remender, I'm I've started reading his Uncanny X Force, and it's a little bit over my head because I'm not a big X Men guy. So a lot of the stuff is like I don't know what they're referencing or the talking about. I had the same experience with it. I, I I bought the first issue and loved it, but wasn't real sure what I was reading. Right, exactly. Like I read the first arc. It, the, the first arc is the same way. So if you were gonna try it, it like it, it's the same as the first issue. Like it's just I I thought it was good, but it wasn't like. I I didn't feel like I got the full enjoyment out of it because I didn't know everything that was happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Question number three. Uh, you've read and have so much of Spider-Man's comic book history and trade. So, what for you is the single best run on the character? Stan Lee's run. No question. That's where all the classic stories and all the best stuff happens. Is from the beginning on to I think he left in the early 100s. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's probably the one. Okay. Question number four. Uh, now, I'm not a big Star Wars guy, and I know uh, there's a lot of Dark Horse Star Wars titles people really like. Do you have any Star Wars comics you think are actually good? Uh, they did that you, a. You recommend? They did a Boba Fett miniseries that ended, I think, a couple months ago called Blood Ties, which is really good. And they're doing one that I'm reading now called D- uh, Darth Vader and the Lost Command, and that's been pretty good so far. I think it's two issues in. It's been pretty good. I'm. It's not amazing or anything but i really like the boba fett one they just did i ha- i haven't been reading a lot of their line because um just money and everything but i have read um some of the knights of the old republic because i'm a big fan of those games and the universe that it's set in and that's pretty good too so awesome cool and uh final question uh what in your opinion is the best comic book video game besides arkham asylum oh, that's a tough one because there's not a lot of good ones <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say Spider-Man on N64, but that seems like kind of a cop-out to me, because that's what everyone would say. I'm trying to think <laughs> of one that's, like, not, like, the typical one, but I can't really... I mean, I like Marvel Ultimate Alliance, the first game, because it was mm-hmm. so, like, you went everywhere in the Marvel Universe. It was such a wide cast of characters. They really dropped the ball with the second game. That one's not that good at all, but you know, the X-Men Legends games are pretty good, too. I really like the RPG Dungeon Crawler. I think it really suits the whole big cast of characters thing, so yeah, I'd probably have to say Marvel Ultimate Alliance. That was a good game. Yeah, that's a good call. Um, I'm not usually into those kinds of games, and they actually really liked those. Yeah, they were a lot of fun, and I think the big disadvantage the second game was is it set it during Civil War and you didn't everything was either a city street or some AIM science lab oh yeah they just didn't have a broad enough yeah it was just the same environment recycled over and over again and the, and the, the character choices were really strange yeah well Dan thanks a lot for being on the show no problem it was a pleasure uh, everybody, uh, make sure you subscribe to Tori GNR1. Uh, like I said, he does a lot of uh, really, really good reviews of uh, video games and comics and uh, all kinds of stuff. And uh, you can also um, you can also watch a video where you tour his room and see all his cool stuff. Uh, he's got a he's got a really great collection of uh, of figures and uh, and um, one of the one of the bigger uh, comprehensive Spider-Man trade collections I've seen. Uh, so anyway, uh, Dan, thanks again for being on. Uh, now back to the show. Oh, no problem. Thanks, Cap. Today's Obscure Character of the Week is brought to you by Egghead. Somehow egg puns are just cleverer when they're delivered by Vincent Price. Have you ever heard of 3D Man? First appearing in Marvel premiere number 35 in 1977, 3D Man was a character set in the 1950s, intended to use that time period as an allegory to deal with then-present social concerns. 
Chuck Chandler was exposed to strange radiation when captured by Skrulls, piloting an experimental airplane and went missing, presumed dead. Wow, how many classic comic book tropes were there in that last sentence? Can you count them all? Well, Chuck's younger, crippled brother Hal discovered that the scroll radiation transformed Chuck into a two-dimensional being and imprinted him on his own glasses. Hal discovered that if he wore the glasses and concentrated, his brother came back into our existence as the green and red clad 3D man. 3D man is actually a combination of the two men's personalities, similar to the personalities of Firestorm. He's three times as strong, fast, and durable as the average man, and he can detect the distinct auras of Skrulls. So naturally, he fights mostly Skrull invaders. And special thanks to Swan6307 for this week's suggestion for Obscure Character of the Week. If you have an idea for Obscure Character of the Week, or some fan art you'd like me to show off, a question you want me to answer on the show, or anything like that, feel free to send me a personal message over Geekvolution on YouTube, and I'd love to hear from you. And now, um, what happens next? What happens next? Ah, yes! The Comic Vault! Today on The Comic Vault, we're going to take a look at Robin number zero. A couple weeks ago, I did a vault comic during Nightfall. This issue happens around the aftermath of Nightfall, and mostly exists to catch readers up on the background of the three Robins, as well as laying the groundwork for upcoming story arcs. But it's not pointless, either. While the way we get this background is maybe a little contrived, the then-current Robin, Tim Drake, just starts asking Nightwing a bunch of questions while they're standing on a roof waiting to take out some thugs, it's an interesting character study on the three Robins. I especially like how it explores an element all three of them have in common, which I'd never really thought a lot about before. A history with Two-Face. Two-Face is in a session with a psychiatrist, and we find that he hates Robin even more than he hates Batman. Twice as much, in fact. When Dick was Robin, he gave Batman time to escape from Two-Face's death trap by letting Two-Face wail on him. But we get this story from both Two-Face and Dick's perspective, and when Dick tells it, it doesn't sound like a victory for the good guys at all. Because just before Two-Face starts beating him, he tries to save the DA from hanging, but he just ends up drowning instead since Two-Face had a backup plan. It's good, complicated character stuff, seeing that Dick never felt good enough as Robin, and seeing Two-Face's almost comical frustration with him. If only Batman was a solo act, he'd have gotten him that time. And this is further complicated by the fact that no matter how much time passes, there's always another Robin. This issue is especially worth looking at now, since Dick Grayson is currently acting as Batman, or at least as a Batman, while Bruce is working on recruiting for Batman Incorporated. At the end of this issue, Bruce decides to take some time off from being Batman, after everything that's happened with Bane and Jean-Paul Valley. He made a mistake making Jean-Paul Batman, of course, but he knows that Gotham will be in good hands if he temporarily gives Dick the mantle. So in case you didn't know it, Dick Grayson has actually been Batman before, and not too terribly long ago. Even though the issue is mostly background and flashbacks, there is a small character arc for Dick. Even with the mistakes he made as Robin, even when he turned his back on Bruce and became Nightwing, Bruce still trusts him above everyone else, enough to let him stand in as Batman. They still have their differences, but there's an unspoken allegiance between the two. I also love this art by Tom Grummet. It's very traditional Batman, but bold and expressive. A little like the design of Batman the Animated Series, but of course, more detailed making Robin number zero about all three Robins, including some stuff about Jason Todd, rather than just a story about Tim Drake, is a good way to go, and it makes their legacy feel nearly as iconic and mythic as Batman's. And now it's time to reveal the year for this year's Batmobile. This particular Batmobile appeared in 1997 and uh, was featured in the JLA Wildcats crossover of all places uh, and was apparently an odd conglomeration of the uh, 89 Batmobile from the Tim Burton film and the Batman Forever Batmobile. Well, hey, that's all the time I have for you tonight. I want to thank my special guest, Tori GNR1, for being on the program. Thank you very much for watching. Um, be sure to support your local comic book shop. And if you're ever in the Kansas City area, make sure to check out Pop Culture Comics in Overland Park, Kansas. That's my favorite comic book store. And remember, uh, if you want to become a superhero, don't finagle your own tragic past, because that's counterproductive. Thanks again. I'm Captain Logan, signing off. <laughs> <laughs>